Welcome everyone to the Spoken Nerd. I'm your host Connor McDonald and this is indeed the first podcast episode for 2022. I hope you've all had a very safe holiday season and let's face it with COVID, Omicron, Delta, you name it, all those other depressing things on the horizon. I thought we'd try to start 2022 with something very positive. And that positive thing, from my perspective, is the number one development tool in the market, and that is Application Express. Now, I'm not going to talk about Application Express from a development perspective. I want to talk about Application Express exclusively for the database administrator. For those unfamiliar to Application Express, and I'll refer to it as Apex probably for the rest of this episode, I thought I'd give you a bit of a background. Going back 20 years, we had the first examples of databases being used to drive internet applications. It's funny how even the term internet was fairly new back then. Everyone referred to it as just the World Wide Web. Like every software vendor, Oracle wanted to get in on this new action, and we introduced a HTTP server product and the ability to drive data from the database straight out to the web server came through a facility called Mod PL SQL. This was our first attempt at being able to write typical database-centric code in PL SQL packages and yet have the output come out to a web page. People familiar with PL SQL can think of it along the lines of a web-based equivalent of dbmsoutput.putline. You would call these routines, typically called HTP and HTF, they were database packages, the output would be buffered into an array, and then we had some logic at the conclusion of the call to read that buffer and render the output as HTML to the calling interface. And thus, you would dynamically write HTML directly from the database. The early iterations of this required a lot of coding, because effectively you were making a PL SQL call for every single line of HTML you wanted to generate. Consider even a simple web page with, say, one to 200 lines of HTML in it. This would typically end up as being two to 300 lines of PL SQL, each one calling various routines to print out the representative HTML tags. Even though it was a lot of work, it was fairly simple work, and people built applications using this metaphor very successfully. As time went on, it was realized this wasn't a very productive way of building applications, and in particular, many components of applications had a lot of repetition and common ground between them. Most web-based applications of the time were either simply printing out information from tables or the results of a query, or they were doing data entry, mimicking the kind of functionality you would have in Oracle Forms, which was probably Oracle's most popular tool of the time. To simplify the application building requirement, Oracle released a product called WebDB. And WebDB was simply a layer that sat on top of the Mod PL SQL engine to short circuit the effort required to build the standard kinds of web pages that were being built at the time. Rather than laboriously hand coding calls to every single line of HTML you needed to generate, WebDB would take a lot of that effort up for you. You would simply say, ah, I need to do a report on this particular table, or I want a data entry form on this particular table, and WebDB would go generate all the required code to render and serve as that application. Still, it was fairly simplistic, and you didn't have a lot of control over the output and the display. I remember working with WebDB version 2, and it did most of the heavy lifting in terms of building applications for you, but we were all longing for the much-promised WebDB 3, which would take that to the next level. WebDB version 3 never actually materialized, and as we were waiting for it, it turned out that there'd been a change of direction. In those days, portals were becoming very, very popular, and WebDB 3 sort of got shelved from a customer perspective and got replaced with Oracle Portal. Portal was a very successful product, but had nothing to do really with the generation of applications using the Mod PL SQL interface. WebDB seemed to have come to a bit of a dead end. Around the year 2000, the same principles that had driven the building of product WebDB got refocused into a brand new version of a similar based concept, namely HTMLDB. 
it was a series of layers that sat on top of the mod peel SQL primitives to build applications very efficiently using direct code from the database to generate HTML. HTMLDB was like WebDB on steroids, an absolute revamp of the concept with much more sophisticated tools for building much more sophisticated applications, including a lot more control over the UI. HTMLDB eventually got rebranded as Application Express or Apex. Ever since Apex was built and released to the public, it was absolutely huge inside Oracle. To this day, we have literally thousands of Apex applications because of the incredibly quick build time and the power of the Oracle database to make them very scalable, very secure, etc. Similarly, outside Oracle, there was a core set of customers that also were very impressed with Apex and it received a fair bit of traction within the customer community. But still, it was nowhere near the volume that people were using things like Oracle Forms, the conventional tools that were used for enterprise applications and Java, JDF, etc. Apex was a much smaller subset of the general application development facilities available from Oracle. I always viewed this as an incredibly missed opportunity by many customers simply because of the power and speed at which you could build applications using Apex. Not that I'm claiming to be any kind of visionary, but lately the term low code has absolutely exploded throughout the IT industry. As the number of moving parts and complexity of building applications has continued to skyrocket, the ability to build applications quickly with less coding effort has become far more paramount in the industry. As a result, low-code platforms are finally having their day in the sun. I always chuckle when you see many other vendors and platforms talking about their latest low-code solutions which have just been built, and these facilities generally offer a little bit of basic data entry, maybe a bit of query by example, and are often touted as almost being ready for the enterprise. When you consider that compared to Apex, which went through that same phase but 20 years ago, it effectively has a 20-year head start on many of these platforms, and all of a sudden Apex has become the go-to platform for anyone running on the Oracle database. If you live in many countries around the world and you've recently received a COVID vaccine, there's a very good chance you are using an Apex application to register or book that vaccine and keep the government agencies appraised of your symptoms, etc. If you ever wanted proof that Apex was enterprise ready, I think there's the most obvious example. On a much smaller scale, the Ask Tom application, which I look after, was built in Apex as well. It was first deployed way back in 2001 and still runs to this day running on Apex. It's a testament to Apex's robustness and success in that Ask Tom has been through every Apex upgrade all the way through to Apex version 21 and it still runs as it did 20 years ago without any issues. So there's a small background for those that haven't heard about Apex before. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to head over to apex.oracle.com to try it out for yourself. But let me now bring it back to the topic of this episode, namely Apex for DBAs. As I said, Apex is a application development tool. Now, DBAs don't normally do that. DBAs write scripts, they look after backup and recovery, server configuration, performance tuning, etc. They generally don't build applications. So why would I be recommending Apex for all DBAs? My motivations here are simple, and that is DBAs are busy. Now, DBAs being busy always strikes me as a strange statement, because why are they busy? I mean, once they have set up the backup and recovery for the databases they're looking after, they've completed the configuration, generally you would think most databases are just set and forget. With the advent of more and more databases being on the cloud, it's even more set and forget. Click a few buttons, run a few scripts, and the database is up and running, and there doesn't seem to be much more to do. Yet I know that when I was a DBA, and many of the DBAs I speak to are constantly very, very busy. And why is this? A simple metaphor to answer this is to think of a database as being like a garden. Yes, you plant the seeds, yes, you do the initial watering, but then it constantly needs attention. Things need to be pruned, things need to be fertilized, things need to be looked after, otherwise things go downhill fast. This is where DBAs are constantly busy. There is a constant amount of small things to do. 
deploy this application, tune this piece of code, reset this configuration, add this particular object, do some grants to this, change the auditing for this. All these small amounts of work that constantly come up as the number of applications and customers of those databases grows and grows. Those small amounts of work is where I want to focus the rest of this episode. Before I do that, I need to prefix this with a small bit of a cultural issue when it comes to DBAs. The discussion of Apex for a DBA is assuming the DBA in a role as an enabler. And what do I mean by enabler? I mean that all of IT really is about business success. While some companies build IT solutions as their core product, the vast majority of IT solutions are to serve some other business function. If IT is about business success, then all IT professionals should be enablers to that business success. DBAs and developers are included. You are performing your role in order to enable business success. It's sad to see that sometimes DBAs seem to have lost sight of this. Some DBAs have become blockers, almost an obstacle to business success. Now, before you all flame me with comments on Twitter, etc., I'm not saying that DBAs should just step aside release all the security privileges and say, everyone just go for your life and just watch the whole world go down in flames. I am saying that for DBAs, there is the concept of what I call good blocking and bad blocking. An example of good blocking would be from a customer I worked with before I joined Oracle. They had their data warehouse sitting on a company-wide NAS storage system. That NAS also included all the VM images for various machines across their network. If you ran a huge parallel query with many, many parallel slaves against the data warehouse, it literally would melt the storage system on the NAS. Thus, all the VM images would then freeze, operations would go down. For that reason, as DBAs, we blocked parallel query against their warehouse because it was good for business success. We had enabled that the VMs would always stay running by blocking some elements that were available on the data warehouse. That's an example of good blocking of function in order to enable business success. An example of what I would call bad blocking was I worked at a place once where there was no ad hoc production query access at all. Now that might be a good thing, but in this particular instance, they had a mechanism where every ad hoc query would be emailed to the DBA, they would then review it and then run it and send the results back. I monitored this activity for a while And I discovered that generally from the time an email was received by DBA to the time it was commenced running was literally less than a minute, which means I don't think any real review was going on. And later we found the DBAs really were just enjoying this gatekeeper role. It was a bit of a power trip. You had to come to the DBA gods with an offering in order to get your ad hoc query run. That's what I view as bad blocking. You have limited or slowed down or blocked business success in order to maintain some degree of control. So I want to stress that if you're going to get involved with Apex for DBAs, I'm prefixing this with the concept of you are already a DBA that wants to be an enabler and not a blocker to business success. With that in mind, in a DBA developer relationship, I generally view there to be three categories of work. The first category is stuff that really is exclusive to the realm of the DBA. For example, backup and recovery, changing network security policies, etc. The kind of stuff that does require a cautious, robust, and very disciplined approach to the maintenance of the data. There's also stuff which lives exclusively within the realm of the developer, namely the writing, building, running, and testing of applications. But taking those two extremes or boundary cases aside, There is a huge amount of middle ground, which often the DBA does, but really almost sits within the realm of the requirements of the developer. For example, copying test data to a development environment, compiling package or deploying to UAT environments. Often these are functions that the developer will request, but the DBA is the person that actually acts upon the request. And I mentioned earlier that DBAs are often incredibly busy. That busyness, I think, comes from this middle ground, the constant stream of requests that come from developers to service functions that they do not have the privileges to perform. Putting aside Apex for a minute, I've always tried to tackle these kind of middle ground activities where developers constantly request things for DBA to do with what I call my rule of one, two, three. 
the first time a request comes in, then I'll just do it. Someone says, can you reset my password? I'll just do it. The second time a request comes in, I'll write a script to do it. Because if it comes in twice, there's a good chance it may come in multiple times. I'll write a script to make it easier to do next time. But the third time a request comes in, then if possible, I'll probably seek to empower the person to do it themselves. The big question is, when it comes to the third part of that rule, is how. How do you enable someone to do these functions themselves and still have some semblance of control? It's difficult because typically a developer is not going to have any OS access to privileged resources. They're definitely not going to have DBA access. And you definitely don't want to be getting into a realm where you simply send them production passwords and saying, hey, look, just do this yourself. Please be careful. All of those approaches are obviously unworkable. Also, the kind of requests that come in in this middle ground are so variable. Sometimes requests are what I would call vanilla. I need to create a user or reset a password. So many of the standard tools available, like Enterprise Manager, SQL Developer, etc., can provide those facilities out of the box. But a lot of middle ground stuff is not. It is particularly bespoke to your particular IT site, your customer requirements, etc. This is where Apex is the perfect tool for DBA. Why is it perfect? For starters, it's a low code environment. It's a very small learning curve, trivial to install. It's very easy for any DBA to have an Apex environment up and running. Also, it's very easy to build applications. Most of the effort in building an Apex application often is getting the UI exactly as the customers like. However, if you're using Apex as a DBA, you're not building public facing applications. You're generally building simple tools. So the effort that's required to come up with a sophisticated UI is not there. You could literally start with just a login screen and a screen with a button that calls some script and your Apex application is done. The starting point for your Apex applications could be a button that lets people reset their production password, a button that lets them pick up trace files and TK props them and sends them the TK prof formatted output. You might even build custom versions of some of the tools that you might see in the standard tools. You might have a specific version of long running sessions or block sessions. All these things can be built with simple queries or simple scripts and exposed via Apex. Immediately, you've solved the issue of having to give production access to people. You've introduced a simple GUI that people can access. They don't need to log onto servers. They don't need to send you emails, etc. Once you have a few simple tools written in Apex, you can now morph that into the customer specific requirements that a standard tool like OEM or SQL Developer or etc. will never be able to do. Now you can build the kind of utilities that developers typically had to come cap in hand to DBAs to get actioned. For example, you might have a facility to copy a single table down from production to your UAT or test systems, or maybe copy an entire schema using data pump. I worked at a customer site some years ago where the ability to flash back an entire database we made available via an Apex application. In this way, they could deploy applications to their test environment, do some testing, flash back the database, deploy again, do more testing in the same way of doing that continuous integration and continuous development. Nowadays, they would probably do something like use a snapshot clone of a pluggable database or just provision a database using something like Docker. All of these could once again be actually exposed via Apex because all Apex needs to be able to do is call a PL SQL routine because a PL SQL routine can call the scheduler and the scheduler can call an OS script. So any operating system script that you've written as a DBA that you wrote for yourself originally to quickly serve a developer request, you can now expose it with a PL SQL call and expose that via Apex and give that facility to the developer themselves. I want to stress, we're not trying to rewrite OEM or rewrite SQL Developer here. What we're doing is looking to fill the gaps where those standard tools cannot ever provide the customer specific requirement functions to developers that are part of your particular business. Once you get into the act of building tools and exposing them via Apex to developers, I honestly think this is a win for everyone. For the developers, they're getting a much more timely response to the request that they would normally send to DBAs because they are simply enacting these functions themselves. As a DBA, you're getting a huge amount of your time freed up 
because that middle ground, that constant stream of requests that come in that are no-brainers to do but consume your time, you are now freed up from. Because you're exposing these facilities via a tool such as Apex, you have total control over who gets access to them. You have auditability. You know who ran what functions and when. That stuff comes out of the box with Apex. And also you have consistency of operation. If you build a facility for someone to grant some particular privileges and that's exposed via your Apex application, then every time a request comes in to someone to grant those privileges, you know you're granting the same set of privileges. Doing things manually generally introduces the risk of errors where one particular DBA might grant one set of privileges for, say, a new developer, another DBA might grant a different set, etc. And for DBAs, this is also an extra bonus. Number one is you're learning Apex. You're learning the basics and fundamentals of how to use and build applications via Apex. This is important because it's probably the fastest growing development tool in the Oracle industry. The other bonus is you're starting to learn about low code. And let's face it, that's probably the fastest growing trend in the entire IT industry. And finally, Apex doesn't cost you anything. If you are running an Oracle database, you already have the ability to run Apex inside it. You simply download and install. It is a no cost option that sits inside the Oracle database. Similarly, you use ORDS to access the Apex facilities and ORDS is also a no cost option that sits on top of the Oracle database. Hopefully, if you're a DBA listening to this episode, that has been enough to convince you to at least start to have a bit of a dabble in Application Express. Whilst its origins are certainly from a development perspective, the ability to use it as a simple mechanism to encapsulate tools that you want to expose to other parts of your organization, whether that be developers or senior business representatives, etc. This is a facility where you can enable business functionality faster and more timely and free up time for yourself to focus on the more important things that DBAs are meant to be focusing on. Example, security. Thanks very much for listening to this episode. I'll put some particular Apex links in the show description. If not, just head over to apex.oracle.com and from there, there's various links in terms of training and getting started and building your first Apex applications as a DBA. See you all next time. Thanks for listening to this podcast. The music credit goes to Zanman from Pixabay Music.